Thank you very much for coming. Our guest is John Watson, who is the chairman and CEO of Chevron, a position that he has held since 2010. That's correct. And let me give you a little bit about the uh, background of Chevron and John. Uh, Chevron is a company that was actually, its predecessor started, I think, in 1879, and it was the Pacific Coast Oil Company. Later, it was bought by Standard Oil. Standard Oil was broken up. It became SoCal. SoCal bought um, Gulf Oil in 1984, and it changed its name then to Chevron and subsequently bought Texaco and um, also Unical. Uh, the company today is a company with a market capitalization of roughly $204 billion and roughly about $103 billion in revenue. It's the 14th biggest company in the United States by, by revenue, and it has about 52,000 employees, about half of them are in the United States. John joined the company shortly after he uh, graduated from uh, college. He graduated from college in the University of California, Davis, where he was a member of the golf team. <laughs> yeah, scratch golf. Golfer then, three handicap now, not bad. Um, he then went to the University of Chicago, get his MBA, graduated in 1980, and then joined um, the company then, Chevron, and then rose up in a series of positions. He headed up the Canadian operation, he headed up strategic planning, he headed up mergers and acquisitions, he headed up international, and he was ultimately at one point the, uh, the head of uh, the vice chairman in charge of government affairs, compliance, and virtually everything else and then assumed the top position in 2010. He's he today, does his homework. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's the, today the chairman of the American Petroleum Institute and also a member of the Business Council and the Business Roundtable, and we're very honored to have you here. Thank so, you, David. Nice to be here. So, um, <laughs> so what could be better than being the head of an oil company when a former head of the oil company is a secretary of state, a businessman is the president of the United States, we're deregulating energy. We're building the Keystone Pipeline. How can it get any better than that for you? Uh, it'd be nice if we made some money. Um, okay. No, it's it's been it's been a, a difficult stretch. Uh, I, I am optimistic about the industry and uh, what I see ahead, but the industry is still adjusting to lower prices. So it's been a challenging time. But uh, all those things, I think, uh, bode well for the industry going forward. Okay, well let's talk about the industry generally. Like people buy iPhones and they seem to like Apple. Um, people buy things from Amazon, they seem to like Amazon. The people buy gasoline, they don't seem to like oil companies. Why is that? <laughs> well, I, I, I think of it this way. There are, there are a couple of reasons. Every schoolboy and schoolgirl in this country, when they, uh, they took U.S. history, the first thing they learn about is the Sherman Antitrust Act. And they learn about the Rockefellers and not always characterized well. And then about every 10 years our industry does something really, really bad. So we have uh, the Exxon Valdez, we have the Enron scandal, we have uh, the Macondo incident. Uh, and so just about the time people are warming up to us, uh, something, something else comes up. So they, they see those things and uh, they, now, the official answer, the official answer is that uh, the consumer research says they don't like things they don't have much choice in okay. buying. And our products are a necessity. Let's talk about oil and gas generally. So um, would you think that civilization would be better off if there had been no oil and gas ever discovered on the face of the earth, no carbon energy? Would we have advanced civilization more or would we be further behind? Well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like asking if, if, if someone hadn't figured out the wheel, uh, where, where would we be? Uh, you know, we haven't found anything better. And there's been plenty of opportunity and lots of incentive to do that. And there have been renewables for a long time, and there will continue to be renewables and other forms of energy. But our product has some pretty amazing characteristics to it that uh, enable everything that uh, we all enjoy uh, so, every day. Years ago, people used to think that there wasn't going to be enough oil in 50 years or 100 years. But with new techniques, is there enough oil on the face of the earth at our current consumption rates and projected population growth to feed everybody for? 100 years or 200 years or 300 years? How much oil is there, oil and gas? Uh, well, there's a lot of it, um, is, is the short answer. You know, people think of the world and think, well, it's, it's fixed. And so it's axiomatic that there are, there's a fixed amount of, of oil and gas out there. And I think that's true. But what is not as well understood is where technology has gone. So let me give you an example. We were a standard oil company in California. One of those oil fields that we discovered 
going way back is the Kern River Field in California. It was, it was found about 1900. And we felt pretty good when we were able to produce and get about 8 to 10 percent of the oil out of the, the, out of the rock. Oil is entrained in rock. It's not just sitting in a pool uh, un underground. But over time, technology has advanced. And so we've learned how to do steam flood, things like that, where you, where you heat up the oil so it moves a little bit easier, so you can extract it uh, much simpler. N now, out of Kern River, we'll ultimately produce 70 or 80 percent of the rock in place. And so technology keeps advancing. The shales. The, the, the shales aren't new. We've been drilling through them for a long time. We've just figured out how to produce from them. Well, so there is, there is a lot of oil, but we keep finding more ways to get at it. Okay, let's put it in context. How many barrels of oil a day does the world consume today? Well, the world consumes about 97 million barrels of oil per day, and the U.S. consumes right. about 19. 19, and we produce roughly how much? Uh, of liquids, uh, all liquids that count uh, roughly Twelve and a half million Twelve, barrels. Twelve and a half, and we consume nineteen, so we're, we're still importing. We're uh -huh. net importer, yes. And by the way, why do they use this phrase uh, "barrels of oil"? Why don't they have a different measurement? Because people don't know <laughs> what's in a barrel. Um, have they ever thought of doing something that people really know? Because people don't see barrels very much anymore. <laughs> have they ever thought of a well, different unit, or they, 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 maybe they want to confuse? But you know, they used to come in a big drum like this, okay. and I, I've had arguments with people where there really aren't forty-two gallons in a barrel. It's really, it's really some other amount, but it's. It's just a unit of okay. measure. All right, so we, we, uh, right now the world is uh, consuming roughly um, 97 million barrels a day. Yes, sir. And we are producing a little bit more than that, or roughly around that? Uh, the markets are roughly in balance uh, okay. today. Uh, I mean, inventories have grown in recent times, and there's debate, are we balanced, or are we getting close to that balance? But give or take half a million barrels a day, the market's pretty balanced. But given, even with current techniques, is it realistic that the United States could be, quote, energy independent in our lifetime? We're still importing a lot of oil. We've tried to be energy independent for 30 or 40 years, and that hasn't really worked. Well, I think in aggregate, we can produce as much energy as we consume for, for liquids, for oil, if you will. I think it'll be difficult to get to the point where we're producing as much as we're consuming, that, that 19 million barrel a day number. Okay. So let's talk about uh, shale oil. You said it was a technique that's been around for a while, but perfected a little bit. Um, it, how much shale oil are we producing in the United States out of the nine plus million barrels a day we're producing? How much of that is so-called um, shale oil? It's, it's a little under five. So when, when people, all, there's a preoccupation with, with shale oil and it is remarkable the progress my industry has made, but it's about five million barrels a day in, a, in that 97 million barrel a day market or of the nine million barrels a day of crude oil or say, 12, 13 million barrels a day of liquids. So we call it shale oil. Some people call it fracking. Fracking is seemed to be a less favorable word than shale oil, I guess. But do you think fracking is unsafe? There's, a, there's a difference. Fracking okay. is the technique. All right, the technique, yes. OK, <laughs> okay. but when you, the word fracking is used, some people uh, get well, upset about it. Anything. Okay. No, you okay. don't get upset. But uh, no. some, some people say that the, it's an unsafe technique because ultimately the chemicals will get into the water supply. What is your argument about that or thinking about that? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, fracking, if you will, is not new. We've been doing it for 60 years. P people think that, that fracking is new, but the industry's been doing it a long time. Um, what, what is the innovation, what has revolutionized the business, is combining horizontal drilling with hydraulic fracturing, which is injecting water, sand, and trace detergents in a way into the rock to fracture the rock so that oil can move to the lower pressure fractures and up through the well bore. It's, it's, it's not new and it's not complicated. We're just doing a lot of it. And in some cases, we're doing it in locations that aren't used to it. I'm going to Pennsylvania tomorrow. It's, it's, Where do it's the water new. and chemicals go, ultimately, after the oil comes up? Where do the water and chemicals, they go into the aquifer, or they just? No, it, no, it, it, comes, <laughs> it comes back up uh, through, through the well bore, and you have a choice of what you can do with it. In, in the case of the Marcellus Shale, where, where right. we are, um, and in, in the Permian Basin, we do a lot of recycling of that water, but you also right. have the choice to uh, in, inject it. We have 150,000 industrial uh, uh, disposal wells in this country for my industry and others, and you have to do that safely. And so that, that's where people uh, get concerned, but it's, it's not new and it's something we can do and, well. And some people say it, earthquakes are caused by fracking. Do you have any view on that? Uh, you need to inject, if you, if you don't recycle wastewater, you need to inject it in a, in a proper way. So you have to site wastewater wells properly, okay. and you have to inject it. For example, if you lubricate a fault, they're called micro-seismic events. If you lubricate a fault, 
Um, this isn't a new subject. Uh, you, can, you can cause earth okay. movements, but uh, they're generally at very, very small okay. levels. And we just have to site dis disposal wells where water is injected, wastewater is injected for our industry and others. You have to site them properly. Why is it that um, the United States seems to dominate the fracking world? Why, why, we're just a small part of the world. Why don't they use fracking other places? Is our geology so much better for it? Uh, the, but part of it is uh, the innovation that takes place in our business. The other part that's underestimated is private property rights uh, in this country. There's tremendous incentive and innovation in this country. Most countries around the world, the mineral rights are owned by government. Um, and so the, the, the progress, the innovation may not be as fast. There are shales elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, properties that we own in Canada, Argentina, for example. There are shales elsewhere in the world. None of them have, have proven to be as productive of what we, as what we have here in North America yet, but uh, perhaps in due course. All right, explain to everybody uh, what happened to oil prices. They were peaking at $140 a barrel a number of years ago. Everybody right. was happy in the oil industry, I assume. So, um, right? Life, I was much smarter. Um, right. $140 a barrel, and people are saying if you go to $200 a barrel or something like that, what happened that all of a sudden they went from 140 down to 22 at one point? What, what was the cause of that? Well, you, it, it sounds, it sounds uh, simple, but it is supply and demand. That 97 million barrels a day, uh, what, what happens in our business is you tend to invest a lot of money, and then you produce. And if, you miss, if the market collectively misgages supply and demand, uh, and you wind up producing a little more or a little bit less, um, prices can fly up. And it takes time to, uh, for supply and demand to, to equalize, if you will. But in other words, I thought what happened was sort of like the Saudi uh, government said they weren't going to reduce their production, and nobody else wanted to reduce their production as demand was going down, so we just had too much. Right? Is that, and well, now? The, the, the industry had invested and more production came online. We also saw a bit of a slowdown in the world economy, so you had a little bit less demand growth. And then uh, you did see several events that took place really at the same time. One is uh, Saudi Arabia, for reasons of market share, uh, chose to increase production into a surplus, what was already a surplus market. That was a, a decision uh, that they made. Uh, you saw sanctions take place on Russia, and with their currency devaluing, suddenly they were able to produce much more cheaply. And then you had the shales in the United States, and so you had a confluence of right. supply events at a time when the market wasn't growing as fast, and prices fall. So today there's an agreement, OPEC has an agreement, mm -hmm. and I think Russia and Mexico are part of it, more or less, so they're going to produce a little bit less, maybe 1.8 million barrels a day less. Is that going to have an impact on prices, and are they um, going to go up? And they've been going down for the last couple of weeks. It has, it has had an impact as natural declines take place in our business. Oil fields decline with time, and so there is some natural decline that helps balance the markets. Um, but what we've seen is the resiliency of the shale uh, in the United States where, uh, for example, Chevron's one of the largest acreage holders in the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico, and we have some two million acres. Um, we're able to produce uh, a little bit more at low prices. And so we're continuing to okay. egg on that supply imbalance and at, at a time when supply isn't needed. So our industry is able to con contribute to hold markets in check. So when oil prices were going down, people who had bought oil were going to, the time they got it on the ship and they were going to ship it to somebody, the price was going down. So I think they bought a lot of ships and just filled them up. They did. And where are those ships now? Are they still have the oil? Or are they, are they, are they waiting for prices to come back? Or what's well, happened? Inventories, world inventories are at, at or close to an all-time high. And so oil is everywhere it can find a home uh, around the world. And so one of the things that uh, OPEC has stated that they want to do is to uh, get inventories back to a more manageable level, because they act as a buffer to any okay. price increase. Now, um, the last administration uh, allowed oil to be exported from the United States yes. that hadn't been allowed before. Is that actually helping the oil industry? It had no impact or what, whatever happened? Uh, yeah, the, the oil export, uh, if you want to call it controversy or issue, is really one of uh, what I call economic efficiency. What's happened with all the shales, shale oils being produced, it's very light. And it's not fit, it doesn't fit in all our refineries. A lot of the refineries in the United States are built along coasts. And they were done because we need imported oil. So they're built for uh, a different type of crude, heavier uh, crude oil. And so literally all the oil in the United States that's, being, that's coming out of the shales 
can't be run in these refineries and turned into gasoline. So what we're doing now is we're exporting that light crude oil, and it's going to refineries better suited for it elsewhere, and we're importing heavy crude. So think of it as just the industry balancing out um, the, the type of crude oil that's, being, that, that's available on the market with the manufacturing capabilities that we have and, here. And is that helping consumers? It, it is. Uh, what was happening before is, since you couldn't export crude oil, U.S. oil prices were lower. And because you could export gasoline, there was rent. We're in an economic forum here. There was rent okay. that was being captured by some domestic right. refiners. And now we've just, uh, it wasn't going to consumers. It was going to refiners. And now it's equilibrated. Explain this to everybody if you could. Um, right now, we have about 800 oil rigs in operation. I think we had 1,600 at the peak, 400 at the low point. Now we've got 800. With 800, we're producing almost as, almost as much oil as we did with 1,600. Why are we producing so much oil with half the rigs? Well, it's, it's uh, the productivity gains that we have made in the Permian Basin. We used to drill these horizontal wells I was describing, and the lateral length, the horizontal portion, might be a few hundred feet. Then it's gone to 500, now 1,000 feet or so. And we have uh, experimented with different types of, of sand and propant to hold those fractures open I was talking about. And so as the industry experiments and gets a little better, we're able to get more production out of fewer rigs, fewer number of, okay. of wells. All right. So um, one of your former colleagues, uh, I guess, in the industry is the Secretary of State. Have you asked him if he's happy with his job? <laughs> you know what? I have not, I have not talked to him uh, since, since he got his job, okay. but I, I, I hear he's doing quite well. OK. And suppose the president called you and said, well, I have another cabinet position I want to fill. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think one oil company CEO is probably enough uh, for, for the administration. Right. Oh, OK. So let's talk about Chevron for a moment. Um, uh, you had the, your, these names that everybody understood, Pacific Coast Oil, yes, and then Standard Oil, and Standard Oil of California, but now you have a name called Chevron. Why don't you have oil in it anymore? And what's a, what is a Chevron? Why did you use that as your name? <laughs> well, um, it, uh, you, you would like this. I'm, I'm sure you know architecture. You know a lot of other things. So, uh, a <laughs> Uh, less than you think about architecture, <laughs> except but, the bills are high. But, but, but a uh, Chevron was actually an, an architectural symbol going back okay. uh, a thousand years. And so uh, uh, some enterprising person in our company in the 1930s figured that out. And of course, it was associated with the military and something of strength. And okay. so that, that Chevron symbolizes strength, and, it, and the military was, has always been popular. And so we use that Chevron symbol. All right. So now um, you produce how many barrels of oil or oil equivalent a day? Yeah, oil and gas equivalent, we produce 2.6 million barrels a day. Okay. And today you have service stations. You have 13,000 around the world or something like that. So of those, um, if somebody goes in and you know says, I want some Chevron gasoline, is it really any different than Exxon Mobil uh, gasoline? Oh, we have gasoline that is unsurpassed and second to none. Uh, really? Wow. At, at, a, uh, at a higher price or a lower price? I'm, su I'm, su I'm surprised you don't know that. Well, I, um, I always thought it was all the same, but it's not. Uh, no. What do you put? You have like a secret sauce like Coca-Cola for me? You put something in there? You know, I, I, I know because we don't market in, in this area, we don't market in New York, you need to come to California, and we'll take you to one of our fine branded outlets there, and, and, and we'll show you the high-quality gasoline that we have. Well, when I go to gasoline station, I'm mostly trying to see what food they're sell selling in the inside part because that's some kind of get something to eat. But uh, I always thought the gasoline was the same. Okay. We have all the basic food groups, salt, sugar. We, we, we have it all uh, in our community and stores. Like, when you're driving your car, let's say, on weekends, you, uh, your company is headquartered in San Ramon, California. Yes, it is. So on weekends, you're driving around, I assume, yourself, and you need to fill up. Do you go in and pump the gas yourself? That's all you can do in California. You have uh, to do so that. We, yes. oh, you, okay. Yeah, self-serve, pay at the pump, all those good What good happens things. if you're running out of gas and you're, the only station nearby is Exxon? What would you do? Uh, you know, that, that would be a bad event. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of people like their cars with, with gasoline in them and so forth. They go fast, they're powerful and so forth. But eventually, maybe electric cars might come along. Would that hurt your industry if everybody goes to electric cars? Well. Uh, Electric cars are, are, are coming, and they're going to fill a role. I think their, their evolution, it, it's going to take more time than people think. Right, right now, most electric cars uh, are on the road because they're very heavily subsidized. They're, they're, we, we, we're paying people to right. buy them, and we have sig very significant subsidies at the manufacturing level. So it will depend on where they can evolve and meet consumer, consumer tastes and preferences. There, there, there are currently range issues and, 
and uh, and other factors. But it's it, by the way, they they still require you know electricity, which requires fuel. Okay, so and we provide that with natural gas. But you don't have electric car yet. Uh, uh, I don't. Okay, so let me ask you about global warming or climate change, as it's now called. Uh, some people think the oil industry has a view that there is no such thing as climate change, and you kind of against people um, who, propose, who say that there is climate change. What is the industry's view on whether there is climate change or global warming? Well, I don't, I don't think there is an, an industry view per okay. se. I was at the API meeting today, and there are literally dozens and dozens okay. of companies, and I, I expect okay. everyone has their own view. I, look, What's I your think, view? I think most people accept there has been some warming. If you look at the temperature gauges and you look at the temperature data, there has been some warming. I, I think the debate is uh, how much is natural, how much is due to uh, okay. greenhouse gases, and what's likely to happen going forward. Uh, I read everything the International Panel on Climate Change puts out, and they have a very wide range okay. of outcomes. So I, I think most people know that. Well, let's say, take the Paris Climate Agreement uh, that was agreed to a couple years ago. Um, if the current president said maybe that was too tough on climate change, and we ought to get rid of it, what would your view be on that? Should we stay with part of that agreement or? You know, my, my, President Obama, before he, right, right as he was leaving office, he said we're talking past each other on this issue, and I think this is one of those examples. If you look at the Paris Accord, um, there, there are a couple things we haven't really come to grips with. One is that it's, it's voluntary, largely. The second is, is, is what, are the, what are the costs going to be? So in terms of the objectives that uh, President Obama set out for the United States, what's it gonna cost and how are we gonna get there? And, and more importantly, actually, because the U.S. is only about 15% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, um, and, we're, and we're actually a very energy efficient economy, is what's going to happen around the world, particularly in the developing okay. world? Because uh, I travel extensively in the developing world, and um, they have the same objectives we do. They, they want affordable energy. They have, uh, they have other objectives. We have to be sure that we meet all the objectives in addition to uh, greenhouse gas, and it's, and it's expensive to do some of the things that are called for in those But you plans. think we should stay in the current Paris Accord, or you haven't made up your mind? Yeah, no, I, 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 I haven't advocated okay. le leaving okay. the Accord. I, I would like to see more definition. I mean, let me give you an example. India's, India's national plan. I, if you read it, it's, it's online, it's 40 pages, and they talk about the importance of alleviating poverty, and they talk about needing affordable energy, and they talk about needing two and a half trillion dollars to meet their commitments. And that's a serious subject. Where is that going to come from? India can't afford that. And so is, where are the funds okay. going to come from? It's a, it's a serious issue, and it merits more discussion okay. than we've had. Now, you're in Washington today, and I guess today you were in Washington for the API meeting, but... Yeah, I've been here four times this year. It's wonderful. Right. So when you go to... Do you, you meet with members of Congress when you're here, or cabinet officers? And Yes. And do you think members of Congress are sympathetic to your concerns or not? Uh, I think members of Congress right now are focused on an agenda Other that's uh, uh, very significant. Obviously, the health care vote uh, today or tomorrow and tax reform, I mean, they, they've got a prescribed agenda. I will say I have been encouraged by some of the actions the administration has taken on the regulatory side. It, you, you know, when you talk about regulations, people's eyes glaze over. And if you try with, try with the general public, they, their eyes glaze over. But I'll tell you, when you talk to business, uh, we, we can go down a, a list of regulations that are raising costs, and I, I, think, I think they have contributed significantly to this economy underachieving. Uh, I would not have thought we could run up $9 trillion in debt, which should be a stimulus, drive interest rates to zero, and never see 3% growth. And I think, I think the reg regulations are a big part of that, not just in my industry, but in many industries. So when you go to talk to members of Congress, what is your biggest agenda item? What is the thing you're asking them to do, if anything? Well, I've been asking a lot about uh, tax reform. I think all of us are curious about, about tax reform. I think, um, you know, every, everyone in principle is in favor of tax reform until it affects them. Um, right. and, okay. and, and, and I think business has, has sometimes, you know, right. been very fractured on this, but I think most people want lower rates. They want the U.S. economy to be uh, competitive, and the issue is how do we get there? So let's talk about your background. You grew up in Northern California. I did. And how did you become such a good golfer? <laughs> well, I started out caddying, my, uh, caddying for my father, so I learned um, a little bit, a little bit from, uh, from him. So you played in college? and Played in high school and college. I got the golf bug early. I was about 11. But you didn't think you could play on the PGA Tour? Uh, I did until I played with a couple of guys that are out there today, or pl played for a lot of years, and I realized I wasn't nearly good enough. Okay. So, but like you've played in the, P in the uh, 
AT&T uh, Pro-Am yes. at Pebble Beach. And is that nerve-wracking when you're doing that, you're playing with the pros and people are watching you? And it, it's, I, I played a fair amount competitively, so I wouldn't describe it as nerve-wracking. Um, you ever hit the ball in the crowd or anything like that? You don't do that. <laughs> I've had, some, I've had some mishaps, yes. Uh, <laughs> but when you're walking along, do people say, hey, there's the CEO of Chevron, or they don't know who you are when you're walking down? Uh, thankfully, they don't know who I am most of the time. Right. So it's good. Okay. So uh, how did you decide to not be a professional golfer? You decided to go to business school. And after you graduated from University of Chicago Business School, did you know you wanted to be in the energy world? And how did you happen to pick uh, Chevron? Well, I had to work uh, all along. I, I, you know, in college, I worked in a tomato cannery, and, and that motivated me uh, to, work, uh, to work a lot harder. Right. So uh, I, and, and to, get, to get better grades. And I, I went straight from undergraduate to the University of Chicago to the business school. I was pretty young, actually. Did, didn't really know very much, but uh, graduated from the business school at 23 and interviewed broadly. and. So all right, you, you, your, your entire career has, has been at one company. At what yeah. point did you realize you probably were going to be the CEO? Did they tip you off a few years in advance, <laughs> or they don't tell you? No, um, I, I really didn't know. In fact, when, when I joined the company, I just was glad to have a paycheck and right. thought about, gee, if I kept my nose clean, maybe I could have one of those jobs uh, someday. But uh, no, it was, it was actually some years later. I was, I was happy as a clam as the chief financial officer of the company, because that was what a finance guy from the University of Chicago might do someday. And uh, then I was asked to run our international business. And so I spent a lot of time uh, around the world, spent the better part of three years on an airplane and you know, with, with all of our international businesses. And it, it was about that time that I, uh, that I realized that there might be something else in store. But um, you know, I just was so busy, I, I focused on that. So they called you one day and said, you're going to be the CEO. And you said, I'll think about it. Or you said, I'll do it. Or you said, no. <laughs> no, it, it's, you, you're. Uh, it wasn't quite that simple. Uh, no. It, it was, um, no, it was something you, we're a long lead time business in our company. We're very much promoted within uh, companies. So you, you, you realize that there are some, some good people and, and, and there are others that are possible for the job also. So you are a little more than 61 now? Something? Almost 61. Almost 61. So you, you have to retire at your company at 65. Yes. You're not going to get the age expanded or extended, oh, I no. guess? No. No. So, so um, already you're grooming your successor, but what will you do when you do retire? Would you consider going to government, or would you go into private equity or something important <laughs> like that? <laughs> um, no, I, I don't think I will go. I, I know I won't go into government. And um, I, I, I actually haven't thought a lot okay. about it because I've been uh, pretty busy. And when you're not making any money, you focus a lot on what you're doing. So last year, actually, now that you brought it up, uh, you didn't make any money. You Thank lost. You. Thank you for that. Well, it was a, you lost $500 million, is that, is that right, for the year? You know, you could have brought up that we've made $20 billion in, 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 in recent years. So well, you have, but we, I, you know, I, my job is to make the You could have brought up point. that we've outperformed our biggest competitors That's for right. any time period. You, you know, we, so it's, no, it's been a rough stretch. And so we're working to get our costs down and to, to return to a suitable level of profitability. OK. So today, what is the biggest challenge that the energy industry faces? Is it uh, deregulation or regulation? Is it the uh, supply, the demand uh, factor, what is it? I think the perception is that uh, getting costs down and focusing on, on earnings and those things uh, is, is the hardest thing. But actually what keeps, um, there, there are two areas that, uh, that, we fo that, that you worry about, if you will. Uh, one is replacing resource uh, over time. We are in a depleting resource business, so you always have to have an eye out many years. Uh, there was a lease sale yesterday in the Gulf of, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. We participated. There won't be any production from those leases for six, eight, ten years. Uh, we, we picked up a lease in Mexico. Uh, the, amb the ambassador's here. That requires exploration work. So we, we think about the long term from a resource uh, point of view a great deal. And then uh, I always think about um, making sure that our people go home safely every day. And that is a preoccupation. Talk about technology. Um, your industry is not considered a technology industry, but is it not really one where you're using a lot of technology to find out whether gas is here or oil is there? And how do you um, use technology to make it possible for you to discover where oil or gas is? I do think of us as a technology business. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think of us as a technology business, but uh, what people don't think of us as a technology business because our end product visibly doesn't change. Even though the gasoline is a lot different in composition than it was years ago, People don't think of us as a technology business, but uh, you know, I worked for the company in New Orleans back in uh, the, early, the early 80s, and we thought deep water was a few hundred feet. 
Now we're drilling wells in seven to 10,000 feet of water. And so it, that takes real technology, and we collaborate with a lot of vendors and suppliers who help us a great deal. But we, technology is a big part of our business. So people think that your job in part is to get oil from other countries because not enough oil here, so you're always looking for new oil. Is it, you have to deal with the heads of state typically when you're trying to get, negotiate these leases? Oh, you know, we do. It depends, it depends on the country, um, but uh, we've got the ambassador to Kazakhstan that, that's here. Uh, Chevron was uh, one of the early companies from the West to come into Kazakhstan after they became an independent country, and so President Nazarbayev is someone that we have uh, a good relationship with, and so we do build relationships. I mean, one, you talked about Rex Tillerson earlier. One of the reasons I think he was selected is because our business is a diplomacy business, and it's mostly a quiet diplomacy business. If we're doing our job well, uh, we may have a difference of opinion with the government, but uh, we, we, we talk to them. So that we do build relationships with governments at all levels. So if I w wanted to invest in the energy industry, would I invest in a major like yours? Should I invest in a, uh, a service company? What, what's, where's the best money to be made in the energy industry over the next couple of years? Well, I've had people tell me they've invested in our stock and they're putting their kids through college here. So I think, it's a, I, I think our stock remains a very good investment. And as I said, we've outperformed our major. Uh, peers. Suppose you weren't gonna, you couldn't invest in Chevron. You had to invest in some other energy company. Where would you? Uh, what, what space? Is there anybody else out there that's any good? You know, I, I, I just can't think of anybody at this uh, at, at this point. Okay. All right, so, all right. And today, um, as you look at uh, the president of the United States and uh, what he's doing, what do you think is the most useful thing he could do to help your industry? Deregulation. Uh, you know what? What I what I would like to, to hear out of our elected officials is a positive statement about the role of private enterprise. I told you I went to the University of Chicago, and I would really love to hear about the virtues of competition, the virtues of free enterprise in this country. And you know, we are we we remain a country that's very popular overseas. Many countries still look up to the United States, and I think we have to have a positive narrative for our own people uh, in in this country to talk about. Uh, all the things that we have going for us, and energy is just one of them. You know, around the world, they think we're the luckiest country in the world. When they say, you've got oil, you've got gas, now you've got this shale oil and shale gas. Uh, you, you, you've, got, you've got vast agricultural, right. you have so much. And I think we could, we could do a lot by unleashing that and do, making sure that we understand that what got us here is a very strong private sector. What about renewable energy? Are you involved in helping to promote renewable in some way? And you think there's enough uh, potential in renewable in our lifetime? Or what is your view on that? Well, uh, actually, we've been the largest producer of renewables amongst the major oil companies, uh, thanks to our geothermal business that's in, the Indone in Indonesia and the Philippines. We had difficulty growing that in recent years, but it's been a, a big business for us. And we've done a lot of work on advanced biofuels, and, and that's very hard. I don't think anyone feels corn ethanol is, is, is a solution. We've got 40% of our corn crop going to that, and it's, it's a big land use issue. But advanced biofuels have been tough. Right. Wind and solar have their role. They're not new. Uh, I just think they, we ought to make sure that they can, they can compete. And that we're, instead of mandating uh, volumes of wind and volumes of solar, um, we, we do a lot of that in this country, and what we're seeing is we're driving electricity prices up. It, I mean, it's ironic. In California, 60% of the electricity comes from natural gas, but utility rates are going up very quickly because we're, we're, we're pushing capacity that may not be needed because we have to hit a mandate right. into the system. So when you're trying to get oil overseas and you have to meet with heads of state, did anybody ever say, well, like, maybe I have a favorite charity you could help or you, some, my son would like a job or you have any of those kind of <laughs> things that ever happen or you have to be very careful? Oh, uh, we're very careful. Uh, that's not, no, nobody uh, ever asks for anything. They just say you have the best. Actually, governments all have different priorities, and they all want local content. They all want to build up the, the industry in their own country. Uh, they want jobs in their own country. So we do face those uh, demands. In fact, they're a part of many of our agreements. And a lot of the social work uh, that we do, we do much of it voluntarily. Um, but uh, they, they want development in their country. They want a better way of life, and, and they want more than just uh, come in, extract, and right. leave. And that was the model 50 years ago. That's not the model now. So let's suppose I'm a young person uh, graduating from college, uh, just as you were, and, uh, or graduating from business school. Why would I want to go in the energy industry? What would be the pitch that you would make to me to want to come in the energy industry as opposed to something more important like private equity? You know, I... I <laughs> You know, th th that's such an antiseptic business. Um, right. You know, I, 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 would, I would want to, uh, I, I greatly enjoy our business. And what I've learned about uh, the things that we do to enable progress 
Uh, you have to have fun. I have fun in our business. If you look at geopolitics, look at technology, uh, it, it, everything we do, it takes, it takes many different disciplines, many different right. areas of expertise to make this business work. And it's a fun business. And uh, I, I would encourage anyone to, I, I always encourage young people, pick, a, pick, a, pick something they're going to have fun with. And uh, I never thought I'd spend 37 years with, with Chevron, but uh, I keep being asked to do different things and have had a lot of fun over the years. So if I wanted to tomorrow, let's say, make a bet on the price of oil, whether it's going to go up or down, uh, which way would you suggest I bet in the next week or two or three? Um, yes. I'm surprised you asked, given, given my track record. Uh, no, it's, it's, well, it's, if you knew mine, you'd be, yours is better, I'm sure. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult. Part, part, of the, part of the difficulty is trying to predict what governments will do. Um, and markets can be, can be very fickle. I, I will say that um, o over the near term, it's probably range bound uh, for a little bit. But if you look forward, uh, it is going to take more than just the shale, more than just some of the short cycle time investments right. that, that you hear a lot about. Uh, we're in the midst of a project where we're spending $3 billion a year, $3 billion a year for the next five years in Kazakhstan because that is a, the Tengiz field uh, which, we, uh, which we have 50% ownership in the company that, that operates it. Um, it we're going to need oil fields like that developed around the world if we're going to meet supply. So we do, make, we do make those kinds of commitments, and it's, it's going to be needed. And it's because oil prices are likely going to need to be higher than they are to, to draw that. Final question, it would be, uh, what's the downside to being the CEO, Chevron, other than interview like this? What, is there something <laughs> that is the downside you don't really like about the job, or is you love everything about the job? Uh, no, you know, I, I, I told my kids, I have two boys. My, my boys are 20. Are they in the energy world? Uh, no, they're, they're not. And, and I told them, you know, if I ever complain, go get a hammer and hit me uh, until I stop complaining, because I'm, I am very fortunate. Uh, you know, there, there's something about, uh, you know, traveling around the world, uh, particularly in the developing world, where you talk to Chevron employees and they are so proud of what they do. Um, in many cases, we're not just producing oil and gas. We, uh, we, we, we operate a meritocracy. We have, we have certain values uh, by which we operate, and they love it. And to see the look in their face when, when, I, when I show up, I may not take myself too seriously, but, but they do. And they are, they are so proud. They're so wonderful. So I don't, wow. I, I, get, I get excited by meeting with employees. Tomorrow I'm going to Pittsburgh and our employees are waiting. And I look forward to that and I have no, I have no regrets and any CEO that complains shouldn't be a CEO. All right, well thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, David.